Don't be scared. I'm the super sweet monster with the super sweet new cereal, Count Chocula. I prefer the real Dracula. Greetings. I am the Count. Oh, uh, hi, Count. I said the real Dracula. I am Dracula. Perfection. Welcome to Teacup for One. I bid you welcome. My name is Matt and I have two degrees and we're back with Vampire Weekend. No, not them. Yesterday, we took a look at how the 1922 silent film Nosferatu influenced our modern perception of vampires, both directly and indirectly. Directly because it solidified itself as a staple in horror and German expressionist cinema, and indirectly because it jump-started a very lengthy legal battle between Bram Stoker's widow Florence Belcombe and the filmmakers of Nosferatu. One of Belcombe's tactics in this battle to take down Nosferatu was selling the rights to her husband's novel Dracula for an officially licensed theatrical production. I assume that the hope there was that an officially licensed adaptation of Stoker's novel would draw the public's attention away from the illegal movie, it would also make sure that Stoker's story was being told properly, and it would make sure that some of the money from the novel's second life was making its way back to the family who owned the rights. But the fascinating thing about how we perceive vampires today is that it's been almost entirely shaped by this legal battle that set all these events into motion that eventually led to Hungarian actor Bela Lugosi sinking his teeth into this role which would then define the characteristics we associate with the creature of the vampire for all eternity. Bela Lugosi was an actor who started his career in Hungary before moving to America in 1920. Eventually he made his way to New York City where he started his own theater company and he was working in films and theater as an actor. But his big break, or the big break that we know him best for today, came in 1927 when he was offered the title role in the Broadway production of Dracula which by that point had already had a successful run overseas in England. The production was just as successful in New York as it was over in England. Bela Lugosi toured with it all the way to California, and by the late 1920s, Dracula was established as a success to the American public. So Universal bought up the rights to produce the play as a monster film. They cycled through a whole bunch of different actors to play the lead role, figuring that Bela Lugosi wasn't well known enough to carry the movie. They even uh, went to Conrad Veidt, who played Cesare in The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is really exciting. But for one reason or another, all their potential Draculas fell through. So, Universal ended up extending the offer to hire Bela Lugosi as one of their Draculas. That's right. One of their Draculas. There are actually two versions of the 1931 Universal Studios Dracula picture. There's the English language version, which stars Bela Lugosi as Dracula, and this Spanish language version, which stars Carlos Villarreal as Dracula. Just the fact that Spanish language Dracula exists is fascinating to me. It was apparently a pretty common practice back in the day to shoot the same film in two different languages using the same sets, the same costumes, and two different casts. So that way a studio could distribute a picture in a foreign market with a cast that was speaking the native language of the audience that was going to be watching it. The cast of Spanish language Dracula would come on set at night, right after the English language production cast had wrapped for the day. So they would shoot the same scenes at night, which was like the most vampire-y thing possible. But the real advantage that this gave the Spanish language production is that director George Melford had the opportunity to watch the footage that Todd Browning had shot that day, and he could think of ways to improve on it and make it better, ultimately piecing together a stronger film. As a result, the Spanish language Dracula is considered by a lot of critics to actually be the stronger of the two films, and having recently watched it for the first time, 
I kind of agree. The cinematography is more dynamic for a lot of the sequences. The supporting cast overall is incredible, but especially Lupita Tavara as Ava. And the movie is about 20 minutes longer, which just allows for much more narrative cohesion. Just all in all, this was the Dracula film that I was expecting the first time I watched the Lugosi film. Speaking of Lugosi, the big question on everyone's mind, how does his counterpart, Carlos Villarreal, do in the role of Dracula? My answer? He's great, but he's different. The best way I can describe it is it's the same experience as watching a new actor taking on a role in an established production. So if you've gone to see, for example, a Broadway show one year and then it's still running a few years later and you go back, it's the same production, but it's a different performer inhabiting the role. So it's like the difference between seeing Kristen Chenoweth as Glinda in the original production of Wicked and then a couple years later going back and seeing Megan Hilty as Glinda. Why is that my example? Because just think about it. Now, when we think of Dracula, or even when we think of any generic Party City brand vampire, we're really just thinking of Bela Lugosi. But in the actual source material, in the play, and in these films, Dracula is just a charismatic, charming gentleman who turns out to be a vampire. Spoiler alert. Bela Lugosi, presumably, was cast in the role because of his insane stage presence. He was the kind of actor that could just walk on stage, or even just the kind of human that could walk into a room and you would be instantly drawn to and captivated by, which is what made him so perfect for the hypnotic, seductive role of Count Dracula. And paired with his talent was his appearance and his accent. This is very old. The marriage of those three things, the accent, the appearance, and most importantly, the charm slash charisma, all came together to become synonymous with what we think of when we think of Dracula. And it was a bit of a blessing and a curse because he was so good in this one role that Bella Lugosi, the person, started to be defined more by the character of Dracula then by his talent as an actor, Dracula became bigger than him in life and in death. Yep, in death. Because here's the thing, after Lugosi died, Universal Studios was still cashing in on his image as Dracula as one of their most famous characters. That face was plastered all over toys, puzzles, probably lunchboxes, because there's always a lunchbox. But little did Universal Studios know, probably, that Bela Lugosi's son, Bela Lugosi Jr., was actually a lawyer, and he launched a lawsuit against Universal Studios for continuing to use his father's image without properly compensating the Lugosi family slash Lugosi estate. All these vampire stories just come back to lawyers. In the seeming classic tradition of Dracula, it started a years-long lawsuit. This one was focused on the question of whether or not an individual's personality and likeness could be considered an asset that's passed on to the family after they die. Like, basically just focused around celebrities. Like, I mean, I can't even give this away for free on the internet right now, so I don't think anyone's gonna be fighting for this when I die. Anyway, at some points the Lugosi family was winning, at some points Universal Studios was winning, but it eventually came to a head and helped lead to the creation of the California Celebrities Rights Act. So this is a legal act that protects a celebrity's image after their death, just in terms of uh, merchandising and products. So my understanding of the act, again based on my labor-intensive Wikipedia research, is that, for example, in the case of the Lugosi family, Universal Studios would have to compensate the family whenever they used Bella's face, like on a lunchbox, but they wouldn't have to compensate them if they were using pre-existing film footage because that's something that they already owned. There you have it, the story of how one actor changed the world's perception of vampires and also helped to lead to the creation of an act that would help future movie stars and celebrities all because of one incredible performance. But for now, friends, that concludes yet another episode of Teacup for One. Let me know in the comment section down below who is your favorite Dracula. Also, if you want to continue with me on my spooky movie marathon, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed already. It's so easy. All you need to do is click on my face. Thank you for joining me today, everyone. My name is Matt and I have two degrees, and that's the T cup for one.